Um, in a way, I also uh, announcements, you'll see that I do have uh, the rest of, uh, I have a new preaching schedule in, that ends after the, uh, let's see, where am I at? October the 20th is the last of this, uh, of this file of witnesses, and then we will begin on November 3rd, uh, choosing, choosing uh, different uh, from the parables of Jesus. So that's in there, and you'll see that I have a suggestion for starting December 1st for an Advent reading, and if you read one chapter in the Gospel of St. Luke, every day in December, to finish up, maybe even late in the evening on the 24th, because there's 24 chapters in Luke, that you wake up fresh on, on Christmas morning, and you'll not only uh, know that it's Christmas, but you'll know for sure why it's Christmas. <laughs> but you just finished the Gospel of Luke. And I think that's pretty cool. And you see it on the bottom, it's a covenant prayer in the Wesley tradition. That prayer is also in our hymnal. But I put it in there to go along with the Advent readings. And it might be a good idea every once in a while through the season of Advent uh, to take a little time out, sit down, and just uh, pray that little covenant prayer. Uh, I think it would be a very meaningful time. We'll talk more about that as time goes on. Our lunch, our last one of our free lunches for the community is today at 11.30. And we will then begin again, hopefully in the spring, when the weather clears and all that kind of good stuff happens. So today, I understand it is shepherd pie. And I'm not sure what all goes along with that, but everybody is welcome uh, to come over and join us at 11.30 to the North Creek Fire Hall, Fire Station, right on Main Street. And, let's see, we have visitors here, and let's see, it's in Lori from Florida, and let's see, we have people from Scotland, and let's see here, we, we have prepared no expense with our visitors. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I love it. and you'll notice when you click it, it changes. It's first one to the first one, and you'll yeah. see that it changes. The scripture. <laughs> and the blue signs are. Margaret and Billy. Margaret and Billy, nice to meet you. And it's easy to there too. But I'm still just saying that's all I'll hear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. I don't consider you visitors, but I'm going to give you a pen anyway. You're a fan. Oh, Bobby, we go. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't even a good wine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure to be here with family. It really is. We don't think do things wrong. We just do things differently. Amen. Oh, uh, which then reminds me of, do you see the hymn there? The, is our opening in, and there's a number. It is 103. I have number 103. The number is invisible. The number is invisible, yes. <laughs> invisible, immortal, invisible. There was once in a church that had published in the same hymn, but they had a misprint and it said immoral, invisible. <laughs> 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 At least we got that right. Was that the first time you joke? I don't know. No, no. Oh, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> now, usually we do the corny joke time right before I do the scripture, and then I realize, you know, maybe God doesn't like that. Maybe God knows whether I do it during the time of uh, announcements. So from now on, we'll do the corny joke at times of announcement. So, today, I'm going to ask you all a question. What did the baby chick say when it looked into its nest, and along with the eggs in the nest, there was an orange. How 
Look at the orange marmalade. <laughs> Look at the orange marmalade. Short, 
when it comes to giving love and forgiveness to our brothers and sisters. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to amend our ways and give freely as you have generously given to us. In the name of Jesus our Christ, hope and peace we pray. Amen. O oh Lord, you have searched us and you know us. You know when we sit down and when we rise up. You discern our thoughts from far away. Sisters and brothers, God knows us, loves us, and God forgives us. God accepts us as we are, and by forgiving us, God never leaves us the same. In the compassionate name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And I'll give you a big hello and amen. And we'll respond with 303, Spirit of the Living God, and the Apostles' Creed on page 7 of the Hymn. Mm -hmm.
picking out different people who have been part of the great cloud of witnesses that has been our ancestry and has been the founders and the carrier forwards of our faith and has handed it over to us and we continue to carry it on hoping that someday people can look back and behold us and they'll say this and these people were part of a new great cause of witnesses. And we want to be up strong to do that. And so as we go each Sunday morning, I like to look at what we do during worship and during your scripture and during time that we do. Sometimes we call it a sermon. I like to look at, it, look at this more as a Bible lesson. Particularly as we've been going through this great plot of witnesses. They don't, they don't lend themselves to like three points and a little poem at the end of a message. Because there is a story and a history, and it's very difficult without getting some background to be able to cover where we are, what we're doing, and what the great cloud of witnesses in this particular witness, in this Sunday, it's Esther, what Esther was all about. So that being said, I am going to concentrate right now on the fourth chapter of Esther, and I'm going to begin at the 15th, 16th verse. And I'm going to be reading to the 17th verse. Hear the word of the Lord. This is Esther speaking, and she's giving a message to Mordecai. Go gather all of the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him to do. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you open our hearts and our minds that not only would we be hearers of your word, but that we would be doers of your word. And for Lord, I pray that the words of my lips and the meditation on my heart is acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. As I look at this little book of Esther's ten chapters, and I would suggest you reading it to get the most out of it in what I say and what we try to teach you this morning. But the central theme that I'm looking for is no place is out of place when we're in the place of God. No place is out of place when we're in the place of God. So as we look at these words of Esther, I want to go back and bring us up to a little bit of history here. This probably took place, I don't know, somewhere between 400 and 500 B.C. There was a time when uh, the southern kingdom had fallen and people were carried away uh, into Persia. The king at that time was, a sh uh, was actually Xerxes, they called him uh, 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 Asherus. He could either call him Asherus or he could call him Xerxes. Uh, it was a time of exile, a time when people, and Esther probably in particular, was really not feeling that they were in a place that they were comfortable. Now many people, as we talked about uh, earlier, in the earlier clouds of witnesses, were quite comfortable in exile. They had learned to assimilate with the, with the environment and the culture. They had built homes and had businesses, farms, and all those kinds of things. But Esther was a little different because Esther had lost her parents. And she was taken in by her uncle, Mordecai. And um, I'm sure there was lots of times that Esther was thinking, what am I doing here? Where am I headed to? How can this be? I am in a strange land, in a strange culture, trying to acclimate. I don't have my parents here with me. I have my uncle but we're being criticized all the time, we're being persecuted by 
a lot of the people who were around us. Now that's not as true in maybe other sections of the exile, but in this particular section, there was a there was a movement against the Jews. In fact, there was even a movement they wanted to eliminate all of the Jews in that particular area. So it was a very difficult time indeed. So here's Esther, and she's just going about her business, and we have to kind of stop. And then we have to go over and say, well, what else is going on around Esther? Well, you have, you have the king, and he uh, decides to have this big gala and big party, and he calls all the big dignitaries and everybody into the palace. And as they're eating and they're drinking and they're eating and they're drinking and they're all feeling very good and high and all the things, the king goes, you know what? I have the most beautiful wife in all of the world. And I would like to bring her in here and show her off to you. Wow. That sounds like we just jumped ahead to King Herod and Salome. <laughs> but at any rate, the king sends for Esther. They say, Esther, King wants you to go out there and, you know, kind of shoes people, show them how gorgeous you are, and let them leer at you. And Esther says, not so much. I don't think I, I don't think I want to do this. Esther, I'm not Esther. Fashion, you, my dear, don't have a choice. And so she says, well, I'm still not going to do it. And the king is very disturbed because the king's word is the law. And then the people that he had at the party, they began to get into it as well. King, let me tell you something. If you let her get away with this, do you think this word won't get out? Do you think that all the other women in the kingdom won't hear about this? Do you, do you think then that all the other women in the kingdom are going to oh, well, if Queen Vashti doesn't have to obey her husband, then why would we have to obey our husbands? We'll have a revolt on our hands of all the wives in the kingdom. Wow. So the king says, mm, okay. Vashti, out. You're disposed. And out goes Vashti, the queen. Never to come back again. Now, as the story goes, the king realizes I'm missing a queen. And I can't be missing a queen, we have to have a new queen. So they decided that, okay, we'll go out and the whole kingdom will tell people we want the most beautiful women that are in this whole kingdom. And then we'll bring them in and we'll put them through a series of interviews and examinations and testing and all that kind of good stuff. And we'll bring all these women before you, King, and then you'll be able to choose the most beautiful woman in all the kingdom. Now here is Esther, and she is known as a real drop and gorgeous young woman. So she gets selected along with all of the others and taken to the king's palace. And she's going through all these things. She keeps it a secret that she is a Jew, because that probably wouldn't help her cause. And after all this goes on, guess what? She, Esther, is chosen as queen. <laughs> now here is a fairy tale story for sure. Here's a young orphan child who was being raised by her uncle in exile in a far off land, not knowing where she is going to, not knowing hardly where she has come from, not knowing what the next day is going to bring, and all of a sudden she's queen. This is a real Cinderella story, only it doesn't have a glass slipper, because she doesn't need a glass slipper, because she's already queen. And everything is fine. She's in this place, and it can't be a place that's all that bad, and everything is cool. Well, maybe not so much. Maybe not so much. She's in a place. It can't be a really bad place, but it's not a place where God is. Not at this point. Because along comes a villain. 
always a villain in this story. And his name is Haman. Haman really hated the Jews. Haman had gotten an order from the king to have a genocide and eliminate all the Jews. But there was one Jew in particular he really hated, who was Mordecai, who had been raising Esther. And the reason that he hated it because Mordecai would sit outside the gate of the palace, and whenever Haman would come by, everybody else would bow, except Mordecai. Of course Mordecai couldn't bow down to a human being. But that really, really disturbed Haman. You know how there's those people we love to hate? You know, you know how when you have a movie, and you have this villain, and this villain is always getting away with stuff. And every time the heroes of that movie get to a certain point, they're always then cut off by this villain. And we can't wait to get to the end to see what's going to happen to this villain. We love to hate. It's like uh, we have to get that little revenge. It was like uh, there was a story about a DEA, Drug Enforcement Agent. And he's, he's Checking the area around the border, around the border between Texas and Mexico. He has a lot of low energy farmer. And this guy is really arrogant. He's one of those people you'd like to see. He is whatever it was. And he says to the immigrant, I'm here and I'm going to look over your farm and I know I'll find some things. And the little farmer said, You don't need to look around. I got nothing. He said, No, I'm here. And you can't stop me, and I'm going to be looking. He pulls out his badge and says, You see this badge? This badge says, You have no rights. This badge says, You have to do what I said. So the farmer, he's a member, he doesn't want to argue, he doesn't want to fight with them. Well, when you go out there, be careful on that section over there. And he says, You don't tell me what section to be careful in. And he goes out and starts looking around. Little farmer, the way the little farmers work. It doesn't have big machinery. All of a sudden, he hears screaming and yelling and help, and he hears this guy running, this DEA agent, running out of the woods, and right behind him is this three, four thousand pound bull with these big old horns. And the little farmer goes running up to them, he gets close enough so the guy can hear him, and he yells, Show him your badge! Show him your badge! <laughs> Now, that little farmer may have been facetious with showing your badge. And you really wanted to applaud, I think, as the bull roared and threw that agent. Haman, in his arrogance, built 70 feet high a gallows to hang Mordecai. That's how sure he was, and that's how much of a villain that he was. Now, again, I'm going to say this. No place is out of place when you are in God's place. Let's say that together. No place is out of place when we are in God's place. And so, Mordecai gets wind of all this, and he sends word to Esther. Esther, you've got to help us out. I believe, Mordecai thought, that you were chosen for this time and this place to be our protectors. You were in, you have the king's ear, you will be able to do this. And so Mordecai, he says, he says, uh, when they told Mordecai that Esther had said, Esther had told him, I can't do this. So I just can't do it. And the reason she, she couldn't, she didn't want to do it, was because there was a law that the king had put down that you had to be invited into the inner court to see the king. Now, if the king didn't invite you, and you just showed up uninvited, 
you will be executed. Wow. That's pretty powerful. And so Esther had said, I can't do that. And so Mordecai says, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all of the other Jews. Going to the 14th verse of the 4th chapter. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise up to the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity from just such time as this. this. No place is out of place when you're in the place of God. No place is out of place when you're in the place of God. So, Esther, as I previously read, said in reply, Go gather all the Jews who be found in Susa and hold fast on my behalf. And either eat or drink for three days, night and day, and I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. There is no place out of place when you're in the place of God. And she said, if I perish, I perish. But she didn't come around to realizing her place until she heard the call. And when she heard the call, she couldn't deny it. How did she hear the call? I am fasting day and night. I have God in my heart. I have God in my soul and every fiber of who I am. I have God in my soul. And if I am here for that larger purpose, then no matter where I am, there is no place that's the wrong place when I am in the place of God. But how do we get to that part? Because this is the most important part of this story of Esther than it could possibly be. Because we can be in all kinds of places, can we? No, we can be in very strange places. We can be in very difficult places. We can be in places we have no right to take any kind of direction, which way we want to go, and what we want to do. But there's no place that is the wrong place when we're in the place of God. But the thing that I think hurts most of us, when I say most of us, I'm talking in general. We pretty much know what's in the Bible, don't we? I mean, we do. I mean, we, if you go to church every Sunday and you do that, and we go into Bible studies, we pretty much know what's in the Bible. The Bible says do this and don't do that. Do this and this will happen to you. Don't do that you won't get this. And all that kind of good stuff. But it occurs to me that Esther was coming at this from a much different perspective. To Esther, she didn't have the written word. She had the stories around the campfires. She had the stories of the elders and the priests. She was a Jewess and she was absorbed and steeped in the Hebrew faith. It became a mystery to her. It became a drama to her. It became a romance story. It was the words of the prophet, from prophet to prophet, and on to her. It was intertwined with her spirit and her soul. In the Western world, we have more of a compartmentalization of things. Now, we, we like to put things where they belong. And it's the same with our faith and our, and our religion and all the things that we, that we do. In other words, the Bible becomes almost like a reference. It becomes like this... This, you look, you look on page whatever, whatever, and you find the answer to this. It's almost looking like a, a, a chart for 1040 form for your eye uh, for your taxes. You know, you just go there when you need something. But for Esther, it was intertwined with her being. So that when she was saying, no place is the wrong place when you're in the place of God. She was always in the place of God. 
And so she can say whether I perish or I don't perish, it just doesn't matter. Now we probably won't have a life-threatening kind of situation that we have to stand up for our faith and say, if I perish, I perish. But I can guarantee us that every single day of our lives we come into a we find ourselves in a strange place somewhere along the line. It may not be a heavy persecution, but it might just be we have a disease in the family that we can't get rid of. It might be we have a wayward child or something going on in that. It might be we lost our job. It might be any number of things. But we can't be in the wrong place when we're in the place of God. And that's what Esther would tell us. And so, with that, I'll say, Amen. Amen. In the ways of joys and peace, no. There's no offering in here, is there? Well, well, well. At this time, let us take our tithes and our offerings. Church, and there we are, church. 
He stood there and he stood doing the pot, but he was going to the Lord. And October 4th, he, uh, he um, came back to the Lord, but still drinking, still doing the pot, and he's still with her again, you know, doing his own thing. And I kept saying, you're an alcoholic. No, 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 I'm not an alcoholic, I'm fine, but he was. So I went to Al Anon for a few months, and I didn't know how to deal with him, so he was out of control. He had, he, he had come back home to live with me, because he had some issues, and he had, he had DUI, and he had some law issues. Well, in January, he decided to go to AA. And he's, he's, he's been sober since January right now. He's back in church, Bible study, sober, going to gym, lost 85 pounds. Sometimes you may think, you know, I'm praying and praying, it's not, God's not hearing me. We prayed for 14 years. 14 years and God came through. So don't give up on your prayers. God hears you. But his timing is not our time. So I just thought I should share that. Instead of waiting for a child, I really. Amen. So when I shared that church, the whole church were crying and saying, Praise the Lord. It was just, and he's just, my house is a different house now. It's just, it's so different. So I just wanted to share that with you. God is Okay, Sue is still trying to recuperate from the fall and uh, from the back injury. And uh, Ken? I'd just like to see what the joy it is to be once again with family and friends and walk three times through the week. We, we traveled, we, we arrived in Toronto on Tuesday and then we went to Niagara Falls uh, and went on the lower, which is the Canadian problem with the meat of the mess. And to sit in that turbulent water in the middle of Niagara Falls and to look around and see God's glory absolutely be poured down the road about us. And then to come and look at the autumn colours of what he's created, it's just joyous. Amen. What an artist God is your creator. Yeah. My joy is that we found him a couple of weeks ago. Um, in uh, 28 M, they just stood there and looked at it for, I don't know, how long. And um, even my husband and I had a camera. Not even No, we had to go Well, you drank it in. We did. Yeah. It was a once in a lifetime camera. Mm -hmm. Phil, concerns for the little people in California. Can't get a break from the fire. Mm -hmm. the fires. Yeah. Sure. Pray for all the conflict in the Middle East. Amen. 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 Pray for persecution, persecuted Christians around the world. And there are plenty of them. Unbelievable. Yeah. And special prayer for Sandy's knee. Yes, for Sandy's knee. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. 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 There's several new problems here. Just pray for me. Yeah, yeah. I know. I forgot about our congregation. And, and we'll, do a, we'll do a class action prayer for God. Instead of I'll, I'll pray for the, I'll pray on my knees. Yeah. yeah. I'll fall right on my knees. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I would like to say also with Kenny, it is a joy uh, to be able to share with family, their family, and you guys are family. Uh, sort of We've just met a couple of fantastic people. Uh, so it's been a privilege to meet with you tonight. And they're going to leave, and it's kind of going to but it's going to mess them up. <laughs> sort of so we're thankful that we've had the privilege to meet with Margaret and Will. I'm not sure if it's a prayer or a concern or a praise. But the grandkids, the kids, the dog, grandkids, dog is coming today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. Can we continue? <laughs> we have a joy of getting some better news for uh, Michael. Uh -huh. That's our way.
Let us pray. My goodness, Lord, it's good to hear silence. There's so much in the ways of the world. So much busyness. So it seems to be little time, and yet time still is 24 hours a day. We pray, Lord, that we would take more time to be in your place, to have our ears open to your call and to your words, to not only speak to you, but to open our ears and listen to your voice in our hearts. To know that you never leave us alone, that you're always willing to guide us, and that you'll comfort us when we're in pain, and you will celebrate with us when we are joyous. You will dance with us when the music plays, and you will sing with us. So we just pray, Lord, that we can be ever present in spirit and mind and body for the wonderful, glorious creation that you have surrounded us with and placed us within. And of course, yes, Lord, the fall colors and the changing of seasons, it always reminds us, Lord, of your never ending love. And though everything else changes, you, Lord, do not change. You are the author of change, yet you are unchangeable. And so we give you the glory and the praise for that. We pray for this church. We are struggling to find our own direction. But we know that we can't be in the wrong place when we are in your place. So give us the patience for what we perceive as unanswered prayer, and yet, Lord, you're just saying it's not the time. But it will be in time. And you'll be ready when it is the time. And Lord, we pray for our, uh, our community, for our country. The divisions are deep, the hatred is great, and we're ashamed. We're ashamed. We can't seem to care for each other as well as you have prayed and as well as you have told us. So we pray, Lord, for an extra measure of compassion, forgiveness, and care for others. And we pray for the situations around the world. We feel the Lord so helpless to do anything, and yet that's not true, because we can talk to you. And you, Lord, hold all of creation in your control. So steady our hands and steady our voices. Comfort us when we want to cry. And give us peace. And Lord, for all that we can't possibly put into words, hear us, even as Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For closing hymn, five on the Spirit of God, descend upon my heart.
Thank mm-hmm. you.